Hello, I'm Zero CEO Jamie Burse, and welcome to the most impactful week in the movement to end prostate cancer. You now have exclusive access to informative and dynamic sessions, interactive presentations, and lots of downloadable educational materials. Plus, you can connect and chat with participants and presenters from wherever you are. Please join me right now for the virtual Zero Prostate Cancer Summit. Hi everyone, and thanks so much for tuning in to Zero's 2021 Virtual Summit. I'm Shelby Monier, Vice President of Patient Programs and Education here at Zero. I'm so excited for this next session about genomic profiling and biomarker testing. And I wanna send a special thanks to Foundation Medicine, our partner on this session, and for also introducing us to Dr. Marnie Tierno, who is gonna be our speaker today. Dr. Tierno is a Senior Medical Science Liaison at Foundation Medicine. And over the last seven years, Dr. Tierno has worked as a medical science liaison for other companies with cutting edge precision diagnostics for prostate and other types of early and metastatic cancers. So with that, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Tierno, for being here and for speaking on this really important topic today. Welcome to Advances in Biomarker Testing for Patients with Metastatic Cancer. My name is Marnie Tierno, and I'm a Senior Medical Science Liaison at Foundation Medicine. I'd like to thank the patients, family members, healthcare providers, and caregivers who have joined me today for this important discussion. I've designed the agenda today based on important topics when it comes to biomarkers in cancer. These topics were chosen because of excellent questions that I received from the Zero community. So we're first going to start with the rise of biomarker-driven treatments for cancer patients, and then we'll move on to recent advances in biomarkers specific to advanced prostate cancer patients. We'll start with homologous recombination repair gene alterations that can lead to PARP inhibitor therapy. Then we will move on to genetic versus genomic alterations because this was a very hot topic based on the questions I received from you. And then we will move on to complex biomarkers, meaning microsatellite instability and tumor mutational burden. And then finally, we'll talk about advances in detection methods based on actionable biomarkers and focus specifically on advances in liquid biopsies versus tissue biopsies. Again, this was another topic where I received several questions from you. So let's look at where we started, which is where we are today when it comes to cancer treatments. Starting in 1920 and 1940, we had the options of radiotherapy and chemotherapy for patients. This unfortunately was a one drug fits all approach because this was all that we had available for cancer patients and it wasn't specific to a patient cancer's tumor. We then in 1998 had the first targeted therapy approval, which was Herceptin for breast cancer. Then in 2010, we had our first immunotherapy approved. And now in present day, we have several targeted agents that are available for cancer patients where we can even have combinations of therapies that are personalized for cancer patients based on the genomic makeup of their tumors. It's an exciting time now for precision because of the number of targeted therapies that are available. As of April 2020, there were over 55 new FDA approved agents. From 2013 to 2020, the FDA approved over 90 indications covering over 25 cancer types. I believe the most exciting news is that there are many clinical trials that are in development now to be able to find new therapies for cancer patients. There are now over almost 5,000 active oncology trials in the United States. 39% of those oncology trials use genomics for patient selection to be able to match a particular biomarker with a targeted therapy. 93% of oncology drugs that are within pharmaceutical pipelines are targeted therapies. 
So we are moving forward with finding new and improved therapies for our cancer patients. So how can comprehensive genomic profiling assist us with finding the right treatment strategy for patients? Well, we can start with diagnostic testing. And with comprehensive genomic profiling, we are analyzing hundreds of genes within a patient's tumor to be able to identify genomic alterations that are specific to the tumor or immunotherapy biomarkers. If we can identify something specific for a patient tumor, we then might be able to find particular targeted therapies to match that biomarker, immunotherapies, or we could even look into clinical trials if there isn't a current FDA-approved agent for that particular biomarker. Now, the important thing to note is that even if we do not find a specific actionable alteration for a patient in their tumor, this also provides good information for physicians because then they can decide that chemotherapy is really the best option for the patient. So let's move on now to recent advances in biomarkers, specifically for advanced prostate cancer patients. What you see here is a timeline of new targeted therapies that have been approved specifically for advanced prostate cancer patients. What we're going to focus on today, starting with at 2017, where it was determined and approved that tumors that were microsatellite instability high, that those patients could receive an immunotherapy known as pembrolizumab. Now moving to 2020, we have additional options. There are gene mutations in homologous recombination repair genes that can allow patients to receive two different PARP inhibitors, elaparib and recaparib, and pembrolizumab treatment is also available now for patients whose tumors are determined to be tumor mutational burden high. The interesting thing about pembrolizumab with TMB high and MSI high tumors is that these are considered to be pan-tumor approvals. So this is not just available for prostate cancer patients. Any cancer patient that has microsatellite instability high or tumor mutational burden high can receive pembrolizumab as immunotherapy. Let's first start with the PARP inhibitors and the approval of these PARP inhibitors for metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. There are two different PARP inhibitors that have been approved, and there are similarities and there are differences with these approvals. The similarities start with two of the genes that will allow a patient to have a PARP inhibitor be available. If in a patient's tumor is found to have a germline or a somatic BRCA1 or 2 mutation, the patient could receive recaparib or elaparib. But the clinical setting is different when it comes to these approvals. Metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer patients will have to have relapsed on androgen receptor-directed therapy, such as enzalutamide, and a taxane-based chemotherapy before they could receive recaparib. The difference is for elaparib, these same patients will have to have relapsed on enzalutamide or abiraterone, but not a chemotherapy before they can receive elaparib. Another significant difference is you can see there are several more genes and mutations within those genes that can allow a patient to be eligible to receive elaborate. Now, these gene mutations are available because they are involved in DNA damage repair. So let's talk a little bit about what DNA damage repair is and why these mutations in homologous or combination repair genes allow a patient to receive a PARP inhibitor. So we'll start with the normal cell. 
In a normal cell, there are two different DNA damage repair pathways. The first, which is base excision repair, is reliant on the PARP enzyme. So when we have DNA damage, the PARP enzyme will come in and repair that DNA. But if we expose a normal cell to a PARP inhibitor, now PARP can no longer fix that DNA damage. So we need to rely on a backup DNA damage repair mechanism, which is homologous recombination repair. Now we have alternatives where there are many genes available with homologous recombination repair that can now step in and repair that DNA damage so that the cell survives. With a cancer cell, with that same DNA damage, adding a PARP inhibitor will inhibit that first DNA damage path pathway. And now the backup pathway is also inefficient because of mutations in the genes that are responsible for making sure that the DNA damage is repaired. So some of these genes could be BRCA. If that happens, both of these repair mechanisms are now defective and therefore the cancer cell will die. There are differences in the frequencies when it comes to alterations that we see in homologous recombination repair genes in prostate cancer. On the left-hand side, you'll see the genes listed here that are involved in DNA damage repair. The gene that has the highest frequency of mutations in prostate cancer is BRCA2, followed by ATM, CHECK2, and BRCA1. Overall, 20 to 25% of metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer patients carry mutations that damage DNA repair pathways. About 12% of patients carry germline mutations specifically, and the most common germline mutations occur in BRCA2 or BRCA1. So therefore, let's talk a little bit more about the differences between germline mutations and somatic mutations. A somatic mutation is when DNA is exposed to cancer-causing agents, such as the ones shown on the right-hand side, and when that happens, it will cause gene mutations. So a big risk factor for cancer is smoking. Smoking will end up initiating several DNA mutations, which then, of course, will result in somatic gene mutations. The difference is for germline mutations, these are specifically inherited mutations that you inherit from your parents, and these mutations can increase the risk of you or your family members from having cancer. An example is BRCA1 and BRCA2, but an important point here is that BRCA1 and 2 alterations can be germline or somatic. Now, there are two different types of testing when it comes to determining a germline or inherited mutation versus a somatic or cancer-related mutation. So first, for the inherited mutations, these are genetic testing is responsible for finding those inherited mutations specifically. With genomic testing, we are identifying driver mutations within that patient's tumor. And with genomic testing, we will pick up both germline mutations and somatic mutations. The reason for that is because a germline or inherited mutation will occur in every cell in a patient's body. And therefore, that's why we can test normal cells with genetic testing to pick up an inherited mutation. However, with genomic testing, we have to specifically look at the tumor DNA. And again, we can pick up within that tumor DNA, whether it's germline or somatic mutations. The most important point 
is that even though we can pick up both types of mutations with genomic testing, we are unable to determine if it is specifically an inherited, inherited mutation or a somatic mutation. The only way to definitively, to definitively confirm that is to do genetic testing. And that will tell you if that gene mutation is actually inherited. The, another big point that I want to make here is that whether or not that mutation is germline or somatic, that mutation can be used as a target or a biomarker for specific targeted therapies. Finally, in order to determine if genetic testing is right for you and your family members, you can speak to genetic counselors and your providers to determine if that's the best scenario. Now I want to move on to speaking about immunotherapies. And another way immunotherapies are referred to is immune checkpoint inhibitors. So on this slide, I wanted to describe how immunotherapies work. If we look on the left-hand side first, a tumor cell that has mutations will present that mutation, shown here in orange, as a neoantigen. When that happens, our immune cells will recognize that mutation or neoantigen as foreign, and it will want to get rid of the tumor cell because it recognizes that it shouldn't be in our bodies. The problem is, is that we have this breaking mechanism occurring where PD-1 and PD-L1 are interacting together and prevents that immune cell from attacking the tumor cell. Now, when we give a patient immunotherapy, these immunotherapies can now bind to PD-1 and PD-L1 and therefore release the break. And so when that happens, this gives the opportunity for our immune cells to now attack and kill the tumor cells. Now, how do we get these mutations in a tumor cell to be able to stimulate our immune system? So one way that this can happen is through another DNA damage repair pathway called DNA mismatch repair. If everything is working normally in DNA mismatch repair, then we have proficient mismatch repair, and that leads to what we call microsatellite stable. There are small, repetitive, repeated DNA segments in DNA called microsatellites, and as long as we have sufficient DNA repair, we will not have a buildup of mutations in those satellites. However, if we have mutations in those genes for the DNA mismatch repair pathway, now we have deficient mismatch repair. And that leads to microsatellite instability or a buildup of mutations within the DNA. Now, how do these mutations then allow a tumor cell to respond to immunotherapy? Well, let's start with microsatellite stable tumors. So we said microsatellite stable tumors will have very few mutations within the tumor. So it will present that mutation as a neoantigen to our immune cells. And again, here's that breaking mechanism that we need immunotherapy for to release that break. The problem is there's only one mutation that the immune cell is really identifying as being foreign for this tumor. And it's not enough to be able to stimulate that immune cell to attack the tumor, even with the immunotherapy. So therefore there's a poor response. But if we have a microsatellite instability high tumor, now we have multiple mutations in that tumor where the tumor can present all these neoantigens and therefore the immune cell is highly stimulated and recognizes this tumor as being foreign. So when we add now an immunotherapy to release that break, we get a good response to immunotherapy. 
So the important point here is the more mutations that are there, the better the response will be to that immunotherapy. Now, when it comes to the different cancer types, we can see different frequencies of mismatch repair deficiency. This was an analysis of over 12,000 tumors. And what was found was that overall, 4% of all cancer diagnoses had mismatch repair deficiency. We also saw differences whether this was late stage disease or early stage disease, where we saw more early stage tumors having mismatch repair deficiency. If we look specifically at prostate cancer shown here, you can see that approximately 3% of patient tumors with prostate have mismatch repair deficiency, and a little over half of those are late stage disease. So now let's talk about tumor mutational burden, which is another type of biomarker that can identify patients that could receive immunotherapies. Tumor mutational burden is a measurement of a subset of mutations in a patient's tumor genome. So what you're seeing here for a TMB low tumor, you have very few mutations. For a TMB high tumor, we have a lot of mutations. Now, how do we find all of these mutations? What causes a high TMB? Well, it's the same factors that we've already discussed. If we have defective DNA repair, we will have a buildup of mutations. If we have exposure to different environmental factors, this will also cause a buildup of mutations and therefore lead to a TMB high tumor. Now, when it comes to TMB high tumors, they will respond better to immunotherapy than TMB low tumors. And this is shown in this clinical trial example here, where the bars in orange are patients that were TMB high, 28 to 29% of those patients responded to immunotherapy, compared to patients that were TMB low, where only 6% of those patients responded to immunotherapy. Therefore, if you have a buildup of mutations and you are TMB high, you are more likely to have a response to immunotherapy. Now, the same with TMB, we can see different frequencies of TMB high tumors across cancer types. TMB high is defined as being greater than or equal to 10 mutations per megabase of the genome. What you're seeing here is the frequency of tumors that have greater than or equal to 10 mutations per megabase, or TMB high, across these different tumor types. And what you'll notice is that for lung and melanoma, they have the highest frequency of having TMB high tumors. The reason for that is because our skin and our lungs are typically exposed more to environmental agents that can cause DNA mutations. Now, differently, you can see here in this red box and the yellow bars, these are specific to prostate cancer patients. Overall, approximately 10% of prostate cancer patients will have tumors that are considered to be TMB high. Now let's go to our final topic, which are advances in detection methods for these actionable biomarkers. And we'll talk specifically about liquid biopsies versus tissue biopsies. So for a tissue biopsy, what we do is we retrieve a tissue sample from a previous biopsy that was performed on a patient's tumor. And this comes to us in a tissue block. And so the tissue that's within this block has a concentrated amount of DNA for us to analyze. With a blood sample, we draw that blood and we then need to find the circulating tumor DNA that's within that blood sample. 
There are many factors to consider when discussing circulating tumor DNA. DNA can be shed specifically from tumor tissues into your bloodstream, but DNA can also be shed from healthy tissue. Therefore, we have a lot of circulating DNA in our bloodstream, as well as other cells and other factors. Overall, the tumor content in blood may be less than 1% of the total amount of DNA in the plasma compared to a tissue biopsy where we can have 20 to 40% tumor DNA for analysis. The reason I bring up this point is that trying to locate the circulating tumor DNA in a blood sample is similar to finding a needle in a haystack compared to the concentrated amount of DNA that we can find in tissue. There are also several factors that can affect the amount of circulating tumor DNA that's shed from tumors. For example, if you have a larger tumor or multiple tumors, you are more likely to have circulating tumor DNA in your blood. The tumor type can affect the amount of circulating tumor DNA, as well as the timing of the blood draw and the type of therapy that you're receiving. If a patient is currently on therapy, it's stabilizing that tumor, and therefore that tumor will not be readily shedding circulating tumor DNA into the bloodstream. That's a good thing, but unfortunately that means that it's not the appropriate time to draw a blood sample because we will not have enough DNA for analysis. Now, there are strengths and limitations to both of these methods. The strengths for a liquid biopsy are obviously that this is a less invasive approach for the patient. It's simpler, you can get faster results. And I think the most important thing is that we can capture what's called tumor heterogeneity. This means if you have multiple tumors that are shedding their DNA into the bloodstream, we can pick up the circulating tumor DNA that has been shed from all of those tumors and be able to determine if there's any differences in the gene mutations between those tumors. Now, the limitations are that of the factors that I just mentioned on the last slide. Not all patients will have enough circulating tumor DNA. Also, a negative result should be confirmed with tissue testing. If we have a negative result, that could be because we did not have enough DNA. So that is why tissue remains the gold standard because it is the most sensitive and accurate way to detect all types of alterations within genes. Now there are limitations to tissue as well. The tumor heterogeneity that I just mentioned which was an advantage for the liquid test, we cannot capture that with tissue. The only way to do that would be to do a tissue biopsy of all tumors within a patient. We also can have issues with not having enough tumor tissue for analysis. So here are some key indications to consider using liquid biopsy in prostate cancer. Number one, when tissue is unavailable or exhausted because of other tests that are performed and in situations where a rebiopsy is not an option. And this could be if the tumor is located in an area that's hard to reach. Patients who cannot tolerate a tissue biopsy, this is also important because now we have the option to draw a blood sample. When the only available tissue is from bone metastases, we have more difficulties doing DNA analysis from bone tissue than we do from other tissues. In cases with tissue insufficient for analysis, if we don't have enough tissue, we can reflex to liquid biopsy. In cases where a molecular diagnosis is required quickly, and of course this is for patients who may be acutely ill. But for tissue and liquid, 
we may identify alterations in homologous recombination repair genes or identify tumors that are MSI high or TMB high to be able to identify biomarkers where there may be targeted therapies available to the patient. So in conclusion, professional guidelines recommend tumor testing in prostate cancer. The reason for this is that we can find homologous recombination repair gene mutations that will allow a patient to receive a PARP inhibitor. We can find tumors that are mismatch repair deficient or MSI high or TMB high, which will make them eligible to receive immunotherapy later on down the line in their treatment. At progression, it's important to do tumor testing because it gives us the opportunity to detect potential resistance mutations that have allowed for a patient to relapse on that previous treatment. Another important point is that we can look after progression to find new alterations that may identify a new targeted therapy or be able to place that patient in a clinical trial where they may be eligible. I'd like to thank all of you for attending today. I hope that you learned something new when it comes to biomarkers in cancer treatment. I'd especially like to thank the patients for attending and I hope that I have empowered you to ask for genomic testing of your tumor because it can provide all of the available treatment options that may be available to you. And I also want to assure you that clinical trials continue and we are trying to find and will find new targeted therapies that will be available for all cancer patients. Thank you very much. Wow, thanks so much, Dr. Tierno. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And I'm also, I have to say, I'm so glad that you commented on really helping patients and their loved ones be their own advocates and asking for genetic testing and, and helping them better understand it. It's just another tool in our tool belts to help um, battle prostate cancer. So I'm so glad that you mentioned that. Um, we're, we're so honored you were able to be part of Zero's 2021, unfortunately, virtual prostate cancer summit, but we are excited to continue our, our uh, relationship with you. So thanks again. And I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Foundation Medicine, once again. Uh, for our attendees, we still have more sessions in store for you this evening. Up next, we'll actually have Dr. Rachel Rubin. She'll be joining us to discuss sexual health after a prostate cancer diagnosis, and I promise you are not going to want to miss it. Um, so for additional information on other topics, please visit our website at zerocancer.org. The issues you care about most are right here at the Virtual Zero Prostate Cancer Summit. Please check out the other topics, sessions, and virtual get-togethers in your Summit app. Remember, you are not alone. Join the Zero community to gain support and more information on prostate cancer at zerocancer.org.